everyone, my name is Rhoda and I'm very honored to be introducing Professor Amy Benzad today. Um, did I pronounce it right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Amy Benzad is the Director of Engineering Studies and Lecturer in Engineering at Wellesley College. Um, she's the founder of the Wellesley Engineering Laboratory, probably known as VLAP here at Wellesley. Um, Professor Benzad received her PhD as well as her Master's and Bachelor degree in Mechanical Engineering from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, Professor Benzad's PhD research involved study of emissions associated with um, cooking fuels, including a novel charcoal made from agricultural waste that can be used as um, cooking fuels in regions uh, where poverty and deforestation are severe. She also investigated the role um, of community-based learning in the core academic curriculum in engineering, and also differential benefits for the approach for women and underrepresented minorities in the discipline of engineering. Um, her current work is focused on educational approaches, uh, as well as research centered on engineering projects that can create positive changes for underrepresented um, communities. At Wellesley College, um, Professor Van Zad teaches introductory courses in engineering, primarily within mechanical and electrical disciplines, with an emphasis on household and um, household scale technologies for local and international development. Um, pedagogies um, Professor Van Zad incorporates into her courses include hands-on, project-based, active learning, service learning, interdisciplinary teaching, and integrated lab um, format. Will you join me in welcoming Professor Gunther? I'd like to also point out that after this introductory talk, we will go all the main focus when you will do some uh, hard work. And in that part of the work, Amy will be uh, working together with Professor Robbie Berg and Lynn Turbeck, who uh, are from the physics department and the computer science department. and. Uh, the, among other impressive things, they are my greatest friends. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, thank you so much. I'm very pleased to be here along with Professors Berg and Professors Turbach. Uh, today I want to explain why engineering belongs in your liberal arts education, given your aspirations as Albright Fellows to lead globally. Briefly, I'm going to get, build a case for engineering in the liberal arts and then give you a chance to explore and experience engineering thinking and approaches. Given that Albright's focus this year is technology, it may not be such a novel idea, um, but I still want to explore it a bit with you um, and help you think critically, speaking as an engineer, about the technologies you may be grappling with um, this winter session. So fundamentally, <coughs> engineering is science applied to serve society. Therefore, as future global leaders and policymakers, having an understanding of technology is critical, especially given the, given the role it plays in conjunction with policy in changing the world. To start, I want to clarify what's engineering and how does it differ from science. So let's start by looking at the roots of the words. So science is from the Latin scire, to know, whereas engineering is from ingeniare, to create. So engineers apply scientific knowledge to serve society. So that sounds pretty liberal artsy to me. Um, so why is it missing from the traditional liberal arts cur curriculum? Well, it goes back a long way, all the way to the education where the ancient Greeks conceived of liberal arts education as an education for free men, those who had the luxury of pursuing ideas and thoughts without the burden of having something to do, having to do something so mundane as making things with their hands. Um, maybe that make, distinction made sense in ancient Greece, perhaps even 100 years ago. But an important goal of a liberal arts education is to allow students to understand and appreciate the world and be able to make informed decisions about critical issues. We no longer only allow free men to study, and perhaps we should um, also allow study of engineering as well. Um, given the role that technology plays in the model world and its increasing at technology, thanks to scientific break, break excuse me, Thanks to scientific breakthroughs and engineering innovation, technological literacy is crucial. There's an outstanding text in the library downstairs called Physics for Future Presidents. And Professor Berg actually this spring will be teaching a class that is um, inspired in part by this book. Um, and it helps a layperson understand the fundamental science that um, concerns our modern world and how to address it. I believe we need an analogous text 
perhaps science applied to serve society for soon to be secretaries of state, <laughs> needed for you to be effective and informed leaders and policy makers. This text doesn't exist yet, but you did read two articles that are relevant, um, I hope. <laughs> so, um, and I want to give a few examples of how technology may play a role in addressing some of the major challenges that um, are uh, defined for our world by the U United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. <coughs> so this is a former student of mine, Jody Wu, standing on a treadle pump, which is intended to improve irrigation. The engineers will tell you that it is, works really well, it's very efficient, it can allow for farmers to increase their income by six times. Imagine if the minimum wage went from $10 an hour to $60 an hour. Six times the transformative lifestyle change. However, if too many people buy these outstanding treadle pumps in a village, you can completely deplete the water supply, the groundwater supply in that village, and create water scarcity for the entire village. Engineers tend not to mention that when they tout this device. Similarly, this is a, a project developed by former students. Um, a kinkajou projector is called, for, the idea was let's have night classes um, in places where there's no electricity, there's a lack of textbooks. If you have a projector, you can still use a classroom at night. That's a really cool idea. But should we spend our money investing on this technology or one that electrifies the community? When does one make sense and when does the other make sense? Women can spend up to six hours per day collecting late water. How can that backbreaking labor be faster, easier? Well, the Hippo Roller was designed to address that purpose. Turns out it's a really lousy technology. It's too heavy, it breaks too easily, it's too hard to clean. Had the engineers who designed this worked with anthropologists, cultural experts, women's studies experts, and econo economists, perhaps they could have made a better technology. But only if all those populations and all those disciplines can communicate and understand each other. Similarly, um, my child has asthma, so we had to buy this spacer for them because if you just try to get a kid to take um, asthma medication directly, it does not work. But if you add the spacer, it works beautifully. Um, this costs 50 bucks, which is not affordable if uh, you're earning a dollar, two, three, even five dollars a day, right? This is out outside of, of your reach. Um, and so some students at Stanford designed this paper spacer that can be made out of just a simple piece of paper, right? Highly, highly accessible and affordable. Sounds really cool. This project no longer exists. I don't know where in the development it died, but it died somewhere, right? So this thing that sounds so cool and so amazing and gets awesome headlines may in fact have some deeper problems that are, are worth investigating. All of this to say, I want you to think about what responsibilities do engineers have in managing how their technology is used? What role does a government have in providing standards that these technologies must meet? We have tremendously detailed standards in certain areas of our world and very limited ones in other areas of our, of our world, particularly the ones that are more recent, right? There's far fewer standards when it comes to something like social media than it comes to automotives. Um, and finally, are the developers of technology neutral service providers or must they consider the implications of their creations? Can engineers without liberal arts training do so? I would argue we can't and that we need students like you to work with us in order to do a better job. Some of the things we might grapple with, um, a prosthetic hand made by 3D printing allows for very custom prosthetics that are absolutely, um, especially for kids who are growing really fast and you can't build a custom one for them every few, six months. That's a really cool use of 3D printing. Um, a scarier one is a hypothetical handgun, which you know has successfully been printed, that can get through a metal detector with, without um, being noticed at all. Um, which, which is, it's 3D printing, good or bad, or both. Um, a hammer, you could call it a lethal weapon. It also builds houses, right? Both are valuable. A car, similarly, also a lethal weapon and tremendously helpful transportation. And when you add the concept of a self-driving car, the ethical implications are magnified um, thousandfold. Finally, when we think about social media, incredible increased freedom of communication and access to other people. Also, as mentioned earlier today, a privacy disaster um, and potentially a creator of insular, insular disconnect, disconnected communities who really can't understand each other. How are we going to solve these problems? Who are the people making decisions for how these technologies are implemented and created? It can't just be the engineers. Similarly, the National Academy of Engineering put out the worldwide grand challenges for engineers. 
Um, and four of the ones they mentioned were providing access to clean drinking water, making renewable energy economical, restoring and improving urban infrastructure, and preventing nuclear terror. All of these problems are not just engineering or technical in nature, right? They all have huge political, economic, and cultural dimensions. Solving them requires multiple perspectives and leaders with sufficiently broad knowledge to take on the challenges effectively. So that's why I'm excited that you learn about engineering. Um, and so I want to just very briefly tell you that I teach a number of classes where you can learn about this one, where you can learn about technology. For those of you who are juniors, you might particularly check out this one, which is Sections of Technology, Social Justice, and Conflict. Um, is very relevant, and Monica and Melissa both took it last semester, so they can all both tell you about it. Um, or you might be interested in Engineering 160 or 111 um, the, this, uh, in, in this fall. Um, and now, if you don't have time or space to take a class or interest, you can also come to me for advising on how to put, get more technology into your life, do research with me or other faculty who do similar research. There's the Wellesley Engineering Society, and we have a speaker series. And finally, we have great connections with MIT and Olin, both to take classes, and there's either even options to go further at, at both of those schools. So. All that being said, whether you're convinced that you should get involved or not, you're going to about to get a very hands-on education and engineering right now. So the challenge we're going to talk about is um, access to um, mobile phone infrastructure. So in 2016, which is the most recent data I could find, there were 7.5 billion mobile phone subscri subscriptions. At that time, there were 7.4 billion people in the world. So that's a little interesting difference I'll let you think about. Um, these are two Malawian farmers who are using a cell phone to communicate. Um, in Malawi, only 10% of people have access to electricity, but 45% have mobile phones. What do those 35% do without the electricity and to charge their mobile phones? That's an interesting thing that has been figured out. Um, and how do we get more of the people access to the grids that they can actually use their mobile phones to connect? One of the key issues is line of sight, right? If there are mountains in the way, you can't get um, mobile to mobile access. Um, so today we're gonna work a bit on that problem. How can we make <coughs> cell towers out of incredibly affordable materials so we can put them up in more places? And why am I asking you to do something hands-on that's not gonna be much like any of your other Albright experiences? Well, at its core, engineering is about designing and building solutions to problems. Educational research based on constructionist theories of learning has shown that people's richest learning experiences often occur when they are engaged in creating, designing, and making personally meaningful artifacts. In today's world, we constantly interact with a variety of technology that's often in intimidating or mysterious or just a black box. But when you become a designer and builder of a technology rather than a passive consumer, the mystery and the intimidation fades. So, we're going to address cell phone towers. I want to give you engineering design 101 so that you'll do a good job building those towers. So what you learn from the engineering design process, this is the world's simplest process. You identify the problem. I've done that for you. We need to build a tall cell phone tower. And the process is as follows. Brainstorm an idea solutions, then create them, then test them, then evaluate them. Then you're done, except there's that extra arrow, right? Because it's very rare that the first time you test and evaluate something, it still works. In fact, incredibly rare, like one in a million level of rare. So you often have to iterate and iterate and spiral down until you get to a good solution to get to the end. And the secret trick in terms of making that spiral be as maximally efficient and fast as possible, because you are in a huge time constraint today, is fail fast, succeed sooner. So the faster you start reading and testing and evaluating and redesigning, the faster you'll get to this endpoint and have a super tall tower today. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna challenge you to think right now, are you simply a consumer of technology or can you be a designer and inventor? Whether you identify that or as that or not, you're going to do it today. So bring your stuff. Meet me in the Science Center focus and let's go create.